Hello and welcome to Church on the Rise. Today is the first day of the rest of your life and we pray that God's really going to speak into your future today. He loves you and he's for you and we'll see you on the other side of this message. For us. Fantastic. Well, that's great. Hey, if you are young, then lunch is on us too at uh, a youth. So there'll be hot dogs and um, that's going to be great and a whole bunch of other things. Let's pray while we're standing. And um, oh, you, you sat down already. Oh, yeah. It's all good. It's all good. Father God, we just pray, Lord, for your word to have its perfect work in our lives today. Lord God, we open our hearts. We turn our hearing aids on. We get, it, we get a ready spirit. Lord, to write down what it is that you're going to speak to us today. Lord, if there's one thing that you need to say to us more than any others, shine your light on it. Lord, that we would give full attention to that and unpack it this week. And as we unpack it, Lord, Holy Spirit, come and give more revelation to that. Illuminate your word today in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Give someone a high five or a poke in the eye as you sit down. So good. Today's uh, message is about being a peacemaker because the Bible says that peacemakers are children of God. Who wants to be known as a child of God? Okay, well, this is for all those who didn't put your hand up and uh, we pray that by the end of the service uh, you would also be known as a child of God. A little while ago, just by way of preface, I brought a thought back from a conference uh, that God was speaking to me at the time about our church. And if you haven't heard that message, then I'm going to bring you up to speed in about 30 seconds. The idea was simply this. As God has called me to lead this church, as we lead forward, we want to see people connected to Jesus. And in the church that God's called me to lead, which is this one, we want to see his name go forward in leaps and bounds. We want to see people set free. We want to see people discover all that there is to be discovered in a life after Jesus. Now, to do that, there's going to be a way that we do that as a church. Now, I likened the story of Gideon, who told people to drink from a water source, and the ones that drank a particular way were ones that were chosen for his army. In the same way, we're building an army. And the way Church on the Rise operates is through leadership, accountability, and submission. And there will be a way that we do things here. There's a way that we do connect groups. And it may be different to other churches, but there's a way that we do it, and that's just the way we drink. There's a way that we do our kids' ministry. There's a way that we do Sunday services, follow up with pastoral care. It was like Gideon choosing warriors in his army. It's not Aaron's way or the highway. It's just the way God's led me to lead our church. That's how we drink here. Now, I I will guarantee if you go to the Anglican church, they drink differently to us, especially when it comes to communion. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Well, they get the good gear. (laughs) It's not right or wrong. It's just different. And so there will be leadership, accountability and submission in the life of our church. If you have an issue with something, can I encourage you, take it to the Lord in prayer. Wrestle with God over it. And if you can't find peace there, ask the Lord the next question, where is it that you would have me planted in terms of church life. That's all that it meant. And I I just know that as we press forward with leadership, accountability, and submission, in the very same way that Rachel shared around communion, within those boundaries, you're going to find freedom. You're going to find an expression of faith. You're going to find joy in the house of God. So back to peacemakers or peacekeepers. We don't want to be peacemakers. Ah, peacekeepers, sorry. We don't want to be peacekeepers. Do you know why we don't want to be peacekeepers? Because 
Sometimes in life we think to keep the peace, don't bring it up. I'm not going there. Because if I know, if I bring this sensitive topic up right now, it could evoke another world war. And I don't want to do that. But peacemakers seek to resolve every issue with the help of God, with the, the instruction of the Holy Spirit. And today, I want to encourage you and help you become, even more so, a child of God as we look at this beatitude about being a peacemaker. God blesses those who are peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Matthew 5 verse 9, going through the Beatitudes. You know, when we look at the life of Job and we've been walking through that uh, story and seeing how God had, you know, prepared him for an incredible challenge, a challenge that I don't think any of us would really like to walk through, but he had to find a way to be a peacemaker. He was given some contrary information from his friends, but he knew who his God was. And in the midst of everything that you face, the one thing that will help you be a peacemaker is knowing who your God is. Knowing what he stands for. Knowing what he's asking you to stand for. In Hebrews 12, 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness... No one will see the Lord. What did we look at last week? Oh, I'm standing in a gale. <laughs> what did we look at last week? Seeing God. Blessed are those with integrity. Seeing God. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Not just the people you like. With everyone. And then I love the next little bit, and be holy. We don't hear that part. We, we hear the other part quite a lot. You know, strive to be at peace with everyone. Well, now it's backed up with, and be holy. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. One of the great misconceptions about peacemaking is people live by the motto, don't go there and all will be well. No, sometimes we need to look one another in the eye. Sometimes we need to have hard conversations. Sometimes we need to not go in with the thought, I'm going to win the battle. Oh, I'm going to win this one. Oh, I've got some beauties up my sleeve. When I, when I drop this one, I won't play all my cards at once. But I'm going to win this one. No, don't go in with a winning attitude. The way that you win in any conflict resolution is when you both win. And when you seek to be at peace, and show holiness. Misconceptions about peacemaking, it's not avoiding it. Don't, don't avoid the conversation. You won't grow. And the issue won't get resolved. And if in my 52 years, 53, correction, uh, years on the planet, <laughs> see, I nearly forgot how old I was. That's a, that's a worrying sign right there. Um, it's this, the longer something goes unresolved, the bigger the potential for the volcano. I'm in that gale again. The longer something goes unresolved, the greater the potential for that volcano to erupt. Just think about that for a moment. We put things on replay up here. We have this, this, this unending movie playing in our head. And when we think of that issue, we hit rewind. And every time we play it, it goes a little bit, a little bit. It escalates every time. We haven't even had the conversation with the other person. Oh, well, they're going to say this. Well, if they say that, I'm going to say this. And if they say that, well, I'll say this. Rewind. Let's play it again play it again and we keep playing it over and over and over and it's amazing that the more we play it the deeper the hurt gets well they've really offended me now you haven't even spoken to them you've just got it on repeat 
And the word that Jesus was trying to encourage his followers with here is blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed who'd have nothing in rewind. Blessed are those that look forward and stop looking back and keep dredging up the hurt, trying to hurt that person back because they hurt me. Hurt people hurt people. And the challenge with that, sometimes you don't even intend to hurt somebody. I don't believe people get up with the intention today, who can I really get stuck into today? Maybe you do, and that's not a great way to live if that is you. But we don't want to see people hurt. Much less if we're Christian, we're trying to see people restored. So we've got to deal with the thing that's on replay. Ann Landers uh, said this phrase, that people live rent-free in her head, referring to negative feelings toward another person. She said, hanging on to resentment is letting someone you despise live rent-free in your head. And we just keep going over and over. Friend, it may be time to swallow hard, take a deep breath, Invite someone out for coffee that you need to get to the bottom of. Pay for their coffee. Pay for their banana bread too. (laughs) Whatever it takes. Walk into a calm environment, not something that's set up for a fight. (laughs) Come in with a smile. Talk about life before you talk about the issue. How are you doing? I need to talk to you today. Look them in the eye. And fill yourself with the love of God before you even begin to address it. Unresolved conflict builds a wall instead of bringing the wall of indifference down. You think if I don't talk about it, there'll be no wall. No, there's a wall. And the only way to bring it down is to talk about it. It puts a wall with your fellowship with God. Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, well, it does because the Bible says it does. No, I'm good with God. Well, friend, you can't be good with God and not good with others. Oh, me and God are like this. Yep. Then everyone else you come in contact with should be like this. You can't be good with God and not good with others. Let's see what the Bible says about that. 1 John 4, 20 to 21. If anyone boasts, I love God and hates detests or loves less his brother or sister thinking nothing of it he's a liar oh that's big words if he won't love the person he can't see how can he love God he can't see the command we have from Christ is blunt loving God includes loving people you've got to love both that's how we know that we love God In fact, 1 John is an incredible book all on love, pretty much. It's a recurring theme. And if you want to know how to love one another, read 1 John, the whole book. Do it in one sitting if you can. Unresolved conflict builds a wall that my prayers aren't even answered. Do a study this week on what unforgiveness looks like. Look at the Lord's Prayer. Forgive my sins as I forgive those who've sinned against me. Now, if I can't do that, how can I ask God to forgive mine? It builds a wall that keeps happiness out. Actually, in fact, let's go back to builds a wall so that my prayers aren't answered. This is for husbands. And again, around this men's night, please don't think that you're ruled out In term two, we we are doing fathers and sons. But we're not only doing fathers and sons, we're doing blokes and men. If you're a bloke, then the term two course is also for you. But this will help husbands. If you want your prayers answered, 1 Peter 3, 7. It's pretty clear. Husbands, be considerate of your wives and treat them with respect so that nothing, everyone say nothing. Nothing. Now everyone say nothing. Nothing. I I noticed that when I first said the nothing, it was only the women who said nothing. (laughs) 
so that nothing hinders your prayers. Look after your wives, men. Read Ephesians chapter 5 and discover how God actually wants you to love your wife so that nothing hinders your prayers. I don't want you praying prayers that don't get heard, don't get answered, don't get resolved. I want to see you flourish in your prayer life as you lead your families. Believe in those things you pray over your families that God hears and there's real traction and action happening from heaven. Thirdly, it builds a wall that keeps happiness out. Those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. Who wants a harvest of goodness? Yeah, amen. I want a harvest of goodness. So how are we going to be a peacemaker? How? How is it possible? Do you believe it's possible? Well, that's a good start. So the first one is offering with an open heart, an open hand, and open ears. So if you're standing in before the altar, the temple, the front of the church, that's an open heart. I'm open-hearted. I've come to church today. And you're giving an offering to God, well, that's an open hand. You know, Lewis talked about being tight-fisted. Don't be tight-fisted. Have an open hand of generosity. And you suddenly remember someone has something against you that's open ears, because now you're hearing from the Holy Spirit going, oh, yeah, how did that did it never get resolved? I was supposed to ring. I've got to sort this out. It says, leave your offering here. Don't run out of the church to go sort it out and take your offering with you. It says, leave it here. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> leave it here. You'll know where it is. It won't go anywhere, okay? Leave it here. And well, that's just what the Bible says. And then go at once and be reconciled to that person. Just read that through again. If you're standing before the altar, the temple, giving an offering to God, and you suddenly remember someone has something against you. Notice it doesn't say, and you suddenly remember that you have something against someone else. It's easy to think that one. No, oh, that's, oh, he took my car park. Oh, no, no, oh, no. He, said, oh, he said he was going to do it, and then he never did it, and then he was going to pick the rubbish, and he didn't pick the rubbish. We could think of a thousand thoughts of, you've got to resolve that as well. But it's when someone has something against you, you'd like to think you knew about it. Why? It affects your offering. It affects... Your offering. Lewis is talking about blessing. We want blessing to flow freely in our lives. Friend, if we don't understand what it takes to be peacemakers, it affects so many different areas of our life and you can almost be forgiven to think, yeah, I tried that Christianity stuff and it just doesn't work. You can only try it if you give yourself wholly to it. And you won't find in all the things that I'm unpacking, even at 53 years old, being saved 40 years, there's so much that's still left to unpack that I can't say I've wholly and solely tried Christianity yet. Oh, God's my God. Jesus is my saviour and I'm full of the Holy Spirit, but I'm still learning. I don't like conflict. You shouldn't like it either. There's no joy in it. Be reconciled to that person. 2 Timothy 1.7, God's not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a spirit of power, love and self-discipline. So in all that we're going to unpack today about how do we resolve conflict, how do we be peacemakers, the first thing I want you to learn and understand is you need to be filled with God's love. He hasn't given you a spirit of fear, a spirit of power, love and self-discipline. Do you know the problem with unresolved conflict? If you don't deal with it with the person, 
you end up telling so many other people about it, which is incredibly unfair because you haven't gone back to the source to sort it out. And if you go back to the source and sort it out, you haven't got a story to tell anymore. There's so much freedom in this church. We need to be filled with God's love, not just to do the things we think are important, but to live this life we've been called to live. If God's going to get all the glory through our lives, he's not going to get the glory through our opinions, what we think about government, what we think about world wars. That's not where God gets the glory. He gets it from how we choose to live and the decisions we make through living our everyday lives. So, point number two, how are we going to do it? We need to ask God for wisdom. James 1.5 in the Living Bible says, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him and he will gladly tell you. And I would say, just hang around long enough till you get the answer. Well, oh, gee, it's windy up here. Something out there. Yeah, <laughs> look out. <laughs> Take a step back here. So if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him. He'll tell you. But hang around long enough to get the answer. Make the decision. I'm not going along with unresolved anymore. You have to make that decision. I'm not going to allow things to be unresolved anymore. I, I need them sorted out. I don't want to be out of fellowship with God. Make that decision. Well, therefore, I have to face some things. I have to sort it out. I don't want my prayers unanswered. I'm going to need wisdom. I don't want to be unhappy. I don't want to be miserable. But I am going to take the first step. I'm not going to wait till someone comes to me and presents it. I'm going to take the first step. If you want to see conflict resolved, take the first step. And say, hey, I don't like that this has come between us. So let's pray before we go any further. Let's pray. Everyone close your heads and bow your eyes. You can do it the other way if you want. Father, we don't love conflict. But Lord, we know that you're not saying to go back and remarry our exes or whatever, but you're saying it is time to bury the hatchet. You are saying it is time to make peace. Help us bring harmony to our relationships. Lord, I pray that you would give our church, the people of our church, the courage to reconcile, the courage to deal with tough issues that have been pushed under the carpet and swept into the corner for too long. Lord, help us to face what we're pretending not to know. Help us to be real and help us to have integrity. Give us the right place, the right time, and the right thing to say to help us come to the right attitude, ready to reconcile. In your name I pray. Amen. So point number three, if we're going to really do this, this is the most powerful ministry that you all have. Everybody has this ministry. And you need to give attention to it because it matters. It's called the ministry of the mirror. Attend to it at some point. Look in the mirror and see who's looking back. Because that's your first point of ministry. How am I doing? This conflict, this unresolved issue, it actually begins with me. It begins with you. What responsibility do you have to, to play in this? What was your fault in this scenario? And instead of accusing... And excusing, well, they did this one. Becomes a, a harka. Before you get to that, what was my part to play? What was going on inside of me? What was the internal mechanism that was turning over and churning 
inside of me? I think there's a screen with that question on it. Instead of blaming, first look at what's going on inside of you. There's two things at play constantly within our lives and we've got to, we have got to resist these things. The first one is self-centeredness. The second one is pride. And they're the two biggest catalysts for conflict. When, you, when it's all about you and everyone else is wrong, pride comes in and it's the biggest catalyst for conflict. Let's see what James 4.1 says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? They are caused by selfish desires that are continually at war inside of you when i'm at peace inside what's happening outside doesn't seem to have an effect on me so when i can resolve that first question what's happening inside of me what, what why did i respond like that i have to go back to my ministry of the mirror and spend time saying lord what is it because as the psalmist wrote, that if I can get before God and honestly say, Lord, point out any offensive way in me, reveal it to me, it's then that he leads me on the path of everlasting. And if I'm on the path of everlasting, I'm not pushing people out of the way. I'm actually bringing people along for the journey and saying, hey, come with me. Let's not let this thing divide us. Let's unite over the things that we're going in the same direction on. And the conflict begins to be resolved. When I'm at peace inside of me, I'm at peace with God. And I'm at peace with myself. And the things outside me don't tick me off anymore. I tell you what, friend, and you will know this, when you can be at peace with yourself, it is a lovely place to be. For too long, we beat ourselves up about the things we should have said, didn't say, could have said, didn't do, could have done, should have done. And we're constantly telling ourselves, you're falling short, you're falling short, pick up the game, come on, mate. That's not what God's word says. It says, come to me and find rest for your soul and deal with this inner conflict. Lead yourself well. Pride only leads to arguments. Proverbs 13 verse 10. It's a conflict killer. Do you want to know the conflict killer? Do you want to know how to kill conflict? Yeah. Okay, two people would come up here and I'll tell you. <laughs> Here's how you kill conflict. You ready? You might need to write this down. It sounds like this. I'm sorry. I was only thinking of myself. It's the ministry of the mirror. What's happening in me? There's not peace within here. Everything else rages. If you want to kill the conflict, present yourself, look the other person in the eye, don't send them a text message. You face to face this, not face to Facebook, face to face it. And you say, I'm sorry. I was actually only thinking of me in this. Do you know it's one of the greatest things when we become so self-centered and full of pride, we only are looking at from the angle of how this best suits me. What, how is this going to over... How am I going to get... What, what, what's the goal I need to see out of this? But when you come at it with, no, I need to think about how it's affecting you. It'll kill the conflict. Saying sorry will kill the conflict. Taking responsibility for it is the next statement. I was only thinking of me. It'll kill the conflict. Matthew 7, 3 and 5. Why do you notice the little piece of dust in your friend's eye, but you don't notice the big piece of wood in your own eye? First, take the, the wood out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to take the dust out of your friend's eye. Now, I was reading this article 
uh, during the week and they were suggesting that Jesus was actually using a lot of humour and they call it um, Hebrew, Hebrew humour. And Hebrew humour is humour by exaggeration. So while we get all really bogged down in this and go, oh, this is serious, Jesus was probably making light of the situation by saying, you've got a little bit of dust. Well, take the telephone pole out of your own eye before you get the dust out of their eye. So it was, uh, it's quite, when you, when you read it like that, you can kind of get Jesus had a sense of humour. Now, here's another one. He said, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to hold on to money and get into heaven. A camel and an eye of a needle? Oh, you're killing me, Jesus. I'm not Hebrew. I'm not Hebrew, so I probably don't get the joke. But when you read it with that inflection, you go, he's having a sense of humor here. Um, he talked about religious leaders, how they strain at a gnat and then swallow a camel. Oh, what's for a camel, Jesus? That's awesome. Oh, you got me again. Anyhow. We, it just flies over and we take it really seriously, but Jesus is using humour here to get the point across. I know the room feels heavy because, you know, we've got stuff going on with people. Let's get it resolved and let's be at peace with one another. That's how God wants us to live. When we're at peace with one another, here's another way to do it. When you're listening, you hear the hurt and their perspective. Because when you go in armed, ready to go to defend yourself which is the wrong position we've just learned, you're not looking at their perspective and you're not really interested in their hurt. But if you understood that where they're coming from is coming from a position of pain, then their perspective is, don't let this hurt me again. Now you can actually take, go back to the mirror and go, well, I've contributed to that. I don't want to contribute to that. Man, I've got to lay me down. This isn't about me. It's about helping a broader perspective take place. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, James says. Each one of you, I love this, each one of you should not look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to unpack this. If you've got your Bible there, circle the word look. Each of you should, not, uh, should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. What's he saying here? You intentionally switch your focus from your needs to their needs. <coughs> Conflict resolution starts with the way you look at the situation, the way you see it. The word look doesn't just say look at your own needs, they, and it says, look at the needs of the other person. Here's the Greek word, it's skopos. That word look in the Greek is skopos, from where we get the word microscope. So if I am going to look to the needs of somebody else, I'm just not going to go, oh, I think that's what you're saying. No, I'm getting the microscope out and saying, what is it? that you are really saying and that you need right now. Scopos. It's seeing the little things you don't normally see. Telescope, you look at the stars, you see them in a totally different light, what you can't see up close. Scopos means to focus. Focus, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. So when the Bible says look to their needs more than yours, he's saying don't just breeze past this. He's saying take your time. Stop. Look at it from their point of view. Oh, I've not seen it from there before. Oh, when you say it like that, I've only ever seen it from this point of view. Oh, and you weren't seeing that. No, but now that you've said it like that, Get up out of your chair and come around the other side. Say, oh, I want to see it from this angle. Do you know when we talk in, uh, in terms of marriage counselling, 
a lot of times there can be an issue that divides and it's someone on that side of the table and someone here and the issue in the middle and it's like well, well you said well, 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 well. and what's happening the issue is dividing the couple but when one person is prepared to say I'm not having this thing divide us anymore and make the first move and get up from their side of the table it is now two verses one and we're choosing to see this together and this will no longer ever be something in our marriage that will separate us again. We've got to make that decision. But in doing that, it's not about winning, it's about laying down. And as you lay it down, guess what? You both win. You can be happy or you can be right. If it's about being right, you're sleeping on the couch. But oh, I'm right. Oh, I'm right. Yep, but you're not happy. Be happy. Being right doesn't matter anymore. I'm going to be happy. And I don't have to win. But I need to help you win. When you're focusing on someone else's hurts instead of your own, that's when we're like Jesus. Romans 15.2 says we must bear the burdens of being considerate of the doubts and fears of others. Speak the truth tactfully is another way that we... Here's something just to be aware of. Some people say, I just tell it like it is. And if you don't like it, well, you can work that out. But I just tell it like it is. Don't be that person. Don't be proud. You don't have to tell it like it is. Be nice. Because when you, oh, I just tell it like, that's not nice. And we're called to be nice. It means you don't really care about the other person. You just want to get it off your chest. Don't be that person. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. How many of you want to bring healing into fractured, broken, hurting relationships? I want to bring healing. I don't want to use reckless words. In Ephesians 4.29, it says, Don't use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what's needed. Sometimes we speak the facts in love and not the truth in love. And the truth is, sometimes we think it's our job, oh, I'm going to speak the truth, I'm going to speak it in love because I love finding fault. And you just tell everyone what's wrong with everything. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Fill yourself with love. Not your love, Christ's love. Agape love. A love that is unconditional. A love that says, the circumstance is not going to make me love you any less. You will find peace enters into the situation. Fix the problem, not the blame. Oh, well, they did it. Well, they did it. Do you know what one of the reasons why in Australian politics, and it's probably true of a lot of political parties around the world, it's why we can get frustrated with our politicians and why nothing seems to happen. Because one side is constantly saying it was their fault. When they were in power, if they didn't do this or do that, then now we've got to fix up the mess and it's all their fault. And the reason we're not doing anything is because they did it. We have a government in power at the moment that keeps beckoning some 10 years later or longer back to Campbell Newman. It was all his fault. Well, just do something about what was his fault and fix it, but stop blaming one another. You see it federally as well. You ever watch Question Time? Oh, well, that's because I did that. No, just fix it. I think our nation would be better if you just made a decision regardless of what, who did what and just fix it. Do something. Please. Stop blaming one another. Just get on with the job. Here's, watch this, Colossians 3 verse 8. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Filthy language 
isn't just swear words. You go, oh, I don't swear, so I don't do the filthy language thing. No, filthy language actually in the original writings means low talk. Talk that brings people down. Not just swearing, it's in there too. Profanity and obscenity, absolutely. But anything that would bring people down. And then as I was reading this this week, because I know we used this scripture last week, but as I was reading this, I, I just got this clue that this is how anger presents itself. When the Bible says, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, well, anger looks like rage. You don't have to guess if someone's having a rage party whether they're angry or not. Malice, it's attached to anger. Slander, you're angry about something. Filthy language to pull people down. It's how anger presents itself. And it's why we need to be on guard. And lastly, if uh, Jess, you could come join me. Focus on reconciliation, not resolution. Reconciliation is to re-establish the relationship. And that's actually what we're called to do. Resolution is to resolve every issue. I think it's more important to restore the relationship. Only because that's what the Bible says. In 2 Corinthians 5... 18 to 20, it says, God has restored our relationship with him through Christ and he's given us the ministry of restoring relationships. God was in Christ restoring his relationship with humanity. He didn't hold people's faults against them and he has given us this message of restored relationships to tell others. We are Christ's representatives we beg you on behalf of Christ to become reunited with God 2 Corinthians chapter 5 18 to 20 I put it in yellow because I just think it's the pivoting thought here that holds this whole scripture together that God while we were still sinners Christ died for us the book of Romans says Notice how it didn't say when you finally got a clue and you sorted everything out and you got clean and then you came to Christ. No. It says that while we were still sinners, while we were a long way off, God through his own justice, his mercy and his love sent Jesus Christ to stand in the gap, to make a way between heaven and earth where there was no way, there was a chasm of sin separating us from God. And God said, enough's enough. I didn't create humanity to be separated from. And he said, well, you were still trying to work all of this out. He sent Christ to come, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the one to forgive us our sins, to treat us as though we'd never sinned at all. And here in this passage of Scripture, he says he's restored our relationship. He didn't hold the people's faults against them. God's not holding your faults against you. He's pleading. He's inviting you to come and saying, you might have come with faults. I want to lift that burden off you so you can be restored to right relationship. I need you to know that I love you. Your faults are not stopping me loving you. The devil would love you to think that every stuff up that you've made this week, every secret sin that you gave into and were tempted by, that God is not happy and you shouldn't have even come today. No! The truth is this, that God loves you and He's not holding faults against you. Instead, He was saying, if you would come, if you would humbly say, Lord, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And as He forgives, He forgets and He removes it from our lives and He begins to restore the relationship. And we get this aha moment where we go, oh, you mean to say that you still love me? 
even though I said those things and did those things, you mean to say that when I thought that I could not even be loved by you, God, that you still loved me. You still sacrificed your son for me. And that you want to make this relationship good and whole and true and righteous. That you want me to walk in blessing and freedom and grace and mercy. Yes. Yes. God was in Christ restoring his relationship with humanity, with you. He loves you. He hasn't cast you off, pushed you aside, forgotten you, overlooked you. Instead, he's calling you and saying, come home. Don't let the past dictate your future anymore. I've dealt with it and I'll keep dealing with it because I love you and I'm for you and I'm about seeing our relationship restored. I love the way Paul signs this off. We beg you on behalf of Christ to become reunited with God. Come back and say, God, I need you. I need you to be the Lord of my life. I'm done hiding behind my faults. I'm done hiding behind disappointment. I want to know your freedom. I want to know the future that you've planned for me. I want to be a peacemaker. Colossians 3.12 says, So as God's own chosen people who are holy, set apart, sanctified for His purpose, and well loved by God Himself, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, which has the power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good temper. We've got to get dressed every day. We've got to clothe ourselves, what with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. For that has the power to endure. If you want to see a lot less conflict happening in your life and be someone who makes peace, then you'll be known as a child of God. And God wants you to be known as his son, his daughter. Come on, let's stand as we close this morning. God is so for you. Shane Claiborne wrote this incredible quote, and it says, Peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. It is a deliberate act of interrupting injustice without mirroring injustice. The act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way, which is neither fight nor flight, but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. It's about the revolution of love that's big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressors free. In Jesus' name. Come on, church. If you were standing in front of a mirror right now, who do you see? Do you see someone you go, I just, I don't know how anyone could love what I'm seeing in the mirror right now. Do you see someone that God could love? You may not be able to love yourself, but friend, I'm here to tell you today, God loves you. If you would trust Him with your life, if you would come to that humble place of saying, I need a Saviour that's full of love, full of grace, full of mercy. Friend, as you begin to accept Jesus Christ, I'll make this commitment to you today. You will fall more and more in love with yourself because you won't see your faults. You'll see your future and the things that He's called you to and saved you from in Jesus' name. Jesus gave this sermon on the mount. This one is just one of eight verses. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. With every eye closed in this auditorium this morning, 
I believe there's people here. It's time that you called yourself a child of God. It's time that you made peace with all the turmoil and the upending and the inside outing and the upside downing of life. It's time to come to Jesus. It's time to get the mess sorted. It's time to stop the conflict. You've been at war with yourself. You've been at war with the world. You've been at war with the ones you're supposed to love the most. And today, I believe God's calling enough, enough. And with humility and grace, if you know you need to accept Jesus Christ, His love, His forgiveness, and His peace, which surpasses all human understanding, if you know that's you today, with no one looking around, I want to invite you just to raise your hand to say, I need Jesus actively working in my life. I'll see it. You can put it down. Thank you, sir. You can put it down. Thank you, sir. You can put it down. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Come on, there's people just doing business with God right now. The conflict is over. The war is over. Trying to work out what living at peace within yourself literally looks like. I see your hand. You can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. It's between you and God. I'm just a guy in the middle. Holy Spirit, as you move through this auditorium, in every heart, in every life, in every situation. Lord, we ask for your peace. We ask for your courage. We ask for your strength. We ask for the revelation of the Word of God to be active right now. As people are doing business with you. They're sorting out their lives before you. Help them to take steps of boldness, to learn what it means to love those around them, to not keep dredging up the past, but to see it covered by your grace. Holy Spirit, minister to every heart in Jesus' name. Help them understand that you, they are loved by you, called of you, and you're calling them today peacemakers, children of God. Give us the strength to live out this call day by day, to involve you in our lives afresh. Come on, church, why don't you repeat this prayer after me? I know there's so many hands that have gone up today. They're just responding to this word. Father God, I come to you afresh today. I need a new beginning. And I want that beginning to be in you. Jesus Christ, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Help me to be a peacemaker. I accept your Holy Spirit, my helper and my guide, to live out this life for your glory and when I come up against conflict help me to respond with the love and the grace that you've responded towards me help me Holy Spirit to make this a defining moment in the rest of my life Amen Hey, thanks for being with us today at Church on the Rise. We pray that you've gleaned something from the message that will actually help you in your walk with Jesus. If today you're making a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, please drop us a line at wecare at cotr.org.au. We'd love to help you, give you resources, tips, tools, and walk with you in your discipleship journey. We pray God's best over you for the week ahead.